Ladies and gentlemen, uh, our third panel of the conference is going to be dealing with a subject that we have touched upon already, at least tangentially, and that's the question of interrogation of alleged terrorists. And we will meet that issue frontally right now. And uh, I'd like to introduce Professor Peter Fever from our Department of Political Science here at Duke, and he will chair this panel. Peter? Well, in this issue, one of the more controversial uh, matters is the matter of ghost detainees. But what we have before you is something of a ghost panel, because uh, two of the names that are in your program are not with us. One of them will not make it. I regret to say that uh, John Smith, who's the Deputy General Counsel from the DOD, is unable to be with us. He uh, informed us late last night of an operational priority, which keeps him from here. Uh, we have had a sighting of uh, Dean John Hudson. Uh, earlier today, and he's off uh, and will be joining us hopefully by the time I call his name. But we're going to go in the following order. We'll begin with um, Heather McDonald and then go with Marty Lederman and then finally with uh, Dean Hudson. Uh, let me briefly introduce the speakers to you and then we'll, we'll get right into it. Uh, Heather McDonald is um, a fellow at the Manhattan Institute, but I think most of us know her from uh, her prolific writing. She's something of a contrarian which makes her always very interesting and important to read. Um, and she uh, is a recently named as a Bradley Fellow. And I've already tried. She will not buy rounds of drinks with her newfound riches. Um, uh, then uh, next is uh, Marty Lederman. And uh, he was an attorney advisor in the Department of Justice's Office of Legal Counsel uh, from 1994 through the 9-11 attacks all the way to 2002. He's now in private practice. And finally, Dean Hudson, who will be joining us shortly, I hope, who's the dean of the Franklin Pierce Law School. But before that point, he had a long and distinguished career as a Navy JAG uh, and uh, rose ultimately to become the Judge Advocate General in the Navy. I would point out, as a longtime attender at uh, Scott Sullivan's conferences, there is a requirement, a quota, that at least some panelists must be former JAG officers uh, for the the conference to be uh, supported by Lens, and uh, we will meet our quota hopefully when uh, John returns. But without further ado, I'll ask Heather to uh, get us started. Thank you so much, Peter. I'm, I'm honored to be here, and, and I may be a contrarian at Duke, but I can assure you that there are three people in Manhattan with whom I'm not a contrarian. I'm, I represent the majority voice, so. <laughs> It's par for the course down here. Um, I'd like to pose to you members of the audience the following situation. You're an interrogator in Afghanistan. And you walk into the interrogation booth. And sitting at the table across from you is a gaunt Saudi chanting Quranic prayers. He was picked up at a safe house in Lahore that contained fake Dutch and Spanish passports, as well as phone records showing calls to suspected Al-Qaeda suicide bomber in Morocco. Now, since the Saudi has arrived uh, at Kandahar, he's resisted all questioning. He spent the whole time in the booth chanting prayers. So you, as an interrogator, have no way to get a word in edgewise. You can't begin your traditional 16 techniques from the Army Field Manual. So what would you guys do? Well, OK, well, let me, let me tell you what people in the, in the Army did. Uh, they tried to devise techniques to break his attention. Sometimes they would call out numbers randomly, like in a football play. Other times, they may play uh, an advertising jingle like Meow Mix. <laughs> All the while that the interrogator was actually in the booth with him, remember. Now, I heard some laughter, but I didn't hear a great shudder of revulsion uh, rippling through the audience at the idea of playing Meow Mix uh, to a Al-Qaeda suspect. <laughs> Well, 
it's a part of modern life, right? It's a, it's a constant torture process we have in uh, our society today. Yes, Sir, can I continue? Yes. Uh, presumably, we're not governed by the Geneva Conventions, or we are, and we are subjected to advertising jingles. Now, Meow Mix was one of the techniques that came out that was denounced as torture by the New York Times. Uh, I happen to disagree. I don't think it comes anywhere near torture. But it was one of the series of gambits that interrogators began experimenting with uh, in using stress in the war on terror. And it was a process that began at the grassroots among the interrogators themselves almost as soon as the fighting began in Afghanistan. Because interrogators at Kandahar and later Bagram soon discovered that the traditional 16 psychological techniques uh, that they'd learned from the army training were basically useless uh, with the detainees that they were facing. They couldn't, for instance, appeal to love of country, love of family. The detainees would say, I've divorced my family. Uh, my obligation at this point is to the jihad. The suspects that they were picked up had a, had a variety of resistance strategies. Some had been taught by al-Qaeda. Others were passed around by word of mouth. And a fierce debate broke out in Afghanistan among the soldiers themselves. Again, this had nothing to do with the Pentagon. And those soldiers assumed that they were governed by the Geneva Conventions. In fact, every message that they received from uh, their superiors said that they were to follow Geneva rules and treat the prisoners above all humanely. Uh, but they still were encountering extraordinary resistance. So they came up with the following rule of thumb. If any stress technique that we may use on the detainees if it's no worse than what we go through ourselves, uh, by definition, it can't be torture. And the most important tool that they came up with was marathon interrogation sessions that lasted 16, 18 hours. Uh, they, the interrogators stayed up with the detainee during those sessions. Now, the problem that the army interrogators experienced initial, from the start at Guantanamo Sorry. Uh, was experienced again verbatim at Guantanamo. Guantanamo was where the army was sending allegedly the worst of the worst, people that did have significant uh, strategic information about Al-Qaeda. And for months and months and months, uh, people were still not responding to interrogation. So in October of 2002, the commanders at Guantanamo began a months-long process of coming up with interrogation procedures that would meet the mandate of humane treatment, but that would break down uh, the resistance. And the process that they went through that lasted almost six months was extraordinarily rule-bound there was consultations continuously about what would be permissible. The final rules that was arrived at eventually in March of 2003 that were in addition to the traditional 16 interrogation techniques were as follows. Change of scenery. Taking a detainee off of hot meals and putting him on meals ready to eat. Those are vacuum sealed cold army rations that soldiers eat all the time and that backpackers eat all the time. Environmental manipulation, but with the proviso that the interrogator had to be in the booth uh, during whatever environmental changes were going on. Reversing sleep cycles, that is basically inducing jet lag, having somebody sleep during the day and stay up at night false flag, uh, impersonating an intelligence agent from a different service, and isolation. 
And the rules that were uh, eventually devised, these following rules for Guantanamo, were surrounded by the mandate that the detainees must be treated humanely at all times. And any use of these additional six stress interrogation techniques had to be approved up the uh, local command structure. Now I want to stop here and make two points. The chronology that I've just given you, the grassroots effort to overcome a extremely real problem, one that eventually became extremely lawyer bound, is not really the one I think that you usually hear in the media about the war on terror. What the media has given us for the last six months is something I call the torture narrative. And that goes like this. In February 2002, President Bush declared that Al-Qaeda detainees picked up in Afghanistan would not be covered by the Geneva Conventions and Taliban fighters would not be accorded prisoner of war status. And the torture narrative that we've heard from the New York Times, the Washington Post, and basically every media outlet in the country argues that that February 2002 Geneva Convention decision led directly to the abuse of prisoners at Abu Ghraib. The reasoning is that once a, that decision was taken, it opened the floodgates for torture and abuse, and that the sadistic maltreatment of prisoners at Abu Ghraib was virtually inevitable, given the, the uh, Guantanamo, I'm sorry, the uh, Geneva decision. Now, the torture narrative always elides the actual interrogation techniques that were approved. It's extremely rare, and only in the last couple of weeks do we ever hear the actual techniques that were supposed to be used uh, at Guantanamo and eventually at Iraq. That having been said, the, the implicit charge in the torture narrative is that it has to be this Im implicitly, that such techniques as putting somebody on meals ready to eat uh, or environmental manipulation, or false flag, is tantamount to torture. I disagree with that point, and I also disagree completely with the uh, causation of the torture narrative. Abu Ghraib was a scandal. It is something that our military is not going to recover from for decades but it had absolutely nothing to do with official interrogation policy in any theater of war. Abu Ghraib resulted from a shameful breakdown in military authority at the prison, from the inability of the Pentagon to respond adequately to the insurgency, to train the military police who were completely overwhelmed uh, at Abu Ghraib, and there was simply no command structure. Nobody there knew who was in charge. You had a situation where uh, our soldiers were running prostitution rings, were running bootlegging rings, were putting graffiti on facilities, were engaged in rampant disrespect. The abuse that was perpetrated at, on prisoners was an extension of the chaos that characterized that environment. Other situations of abuse, it's the same situation. The soldiers were acting completely outside of their authority. Their behavior was not approved by policy. In fact, had the rules been followed, had the rules that I just gave you for interrogating prisoners in Guantanamo or Iraq been followed to the letter, there is not a chance that Abu Ghraib could have happened. Now the second point I want to make is, is one that uh, I feel is, was, was emphasized especially by Mr. Pavitt today, which is we still are th facing a threat. 
And although he pointed to the limits of intelligence, nevertheless, intelligence remains our most important weapon uh, in, in disarming terrorism. There is simply not a hope that we can target Harden our way out of, the, out of the risk. But sometimes when I read the torture narrative, I get the impression that the pressure that was placed on interrogators to gather intelligence was illegitimate. Uh, that somehow this was improper of the Pentagon High Command to be squeezing for intelligence. I see no other way around it. Uh, nothing is going to protect us. Now, do I condone torture? Absolutely not. Nothing I've said implies any approval for torture. I do, however, believe that faced what those interrogators were facing, that it was legitimate to start pushing the boundaries on stress. Those who criticize the official policies that were, that were developed, I think, have an obligation to suggest an alternative. And I've never heard one. The final response that I have to the torture narrative is, in my view, uh, Geneva Convention status is not an entitlement. It's not a right that any, any, combat, any enemy combatant gets by virtue of simply existing. I think the Geneva Conventions, especially Prisoner of War, uh, Geneva III, was written to apply as a, to certain behaviors. Uh, it's a privilege earned by behavior. It's not something that everybody who walks into the battlefield gets. I think the decision of George Bush's not to apply the Genevas to Al-Qaeda suspects was proper. If it wasn't, I don't think we would have needed to go through the debate in 1977 about Protocol 1. It would have been apparent at that time uh, that terrorists were covered, and it was assumed at that time that they were not. Now, it's often said that if we if we treat the Genevas as not a matter of entitlement, but actually look at whether somebody's behavior as a combatant has earned them Geneva status, that that makes us more at risk, that we're going to put our tr troops at risk by treating the Genevas the letter of the law. I think it's just the opposite. I think that if you accord Geneva status to terrorists, who violate every, every rule of war, you are destroying any obligation, any, any incentive that a combatant may have to follow those rules. It would be making them an entitlement that I think would put us at greatest risk. Another argument that's often made is that any thinking about additional interrogation techniques beyond the traditional 16 is a slippery slope that is going to lead to Abu Ghraib. That's a theoretical argument. I disagree with it. I think that it is possible to stop along the way. Uh, again, I don't see what happened in prisoner abuse as a result of interrogation policies. I see it as a result of a breakdown of command discipline. In conclusion, uh, what concerns me at the moment, and again, given the urgency that I think Mr. Pavitt expressed, that the threat is still out there, the need for intelligence is as crucial as ever. Right now, the Pentagon has reacted to the Abu Ghraib scandal, understandably, but in such a way that we have now shut down not just the stress interrogation techniques, but even traditional techniques that are going on right now in Raleigh-Durham police precincts. Good cop, bad cop type interrogation is considered too hostile, too aggressive to be used. A NYPD detective in Guantanamo 
uh, frustrated with the sort of bureaucracy that he's now experiencing. Any, every technique now has to be approved all the way into the Pentagon by people who've never conducted an interrogation in their lives. He said, if I could just get back to New York, get me a good ADA, uh, and I'd be able to get these guys to talk, not because he's going to apply the third degree, but because he's going to be able to use uh, certain squeeze techniques that are now completely outlawed for uh, terror suspects. I think that's a dangerous situation, and I think we need to figure out a way to move back from it. Thank you very much. Um, I, I came at this issue from a legal angle. Um, obviously, most of the debate that you've been hearing in the newspapers and on TV um, in the last few months and years has been focused on figuring out just exactly what the interrogation practices have been of the United States in various facilities, um, how those practices became so horrifying so quickly and so consistently in so many different facilities and assigning responsibility for the abuses that have occurred. Um, Ms. McDonald has suggested that, in fact, the Pentagon leadership is not responsible for the abuses. She and I. That's not quite true. They're responsible for abuse, but not by interrogation. But, but not because of their interrogation right. policies. Their interrogation policies are not responsible for the abuses. I think the record is quite otherwise. However, that debate, which we've had online and elsewhere, and many other people have as well, and I would just um, ask you to turn to the official investigations that have been released so far for the evidence. Um, I'd like to put that to the side today because I think the more important questions are forward-looking. Um, and in particular, I want to talk about what I think the law is today and what the administration believes the law is today and what the law the administration has been using is, what, the, what, what interrogation techniques the law permits going forward, and the questions of whether we should change the law in any way to, to change what, what is acceptable and what's not. Um, until 2002, this really would not have been much of an issue, because even with respect to combatant detainees who the United States believed were not entitled to Geneva Convention protections, Korean detainees, Viet Cong, and, and others, the policy of the United States had been for decades to treat all detainees as though they were POWs entitled to POW protection under Geneva, even when the law did not require us to do so. And Geneva for POWs is quite severe in limiting what an interrogating or a detaining um, officer may do in terms of trying to elicit, to, to elicit information. Uh, in, in particular, um, it prohibits any form of coercion, and um, and any form of disadvantageous treatment whatsoever if a detainee refuses to answer any questions. Now that's pretty dramatic um, in terms of its limitations. But as early as the 1960s, the Army Field Manual began to use non began to prescribe, and the Army began to use non-coercive techniques to try to elicit such information. Uh, different forms of trickery, of persuasion, of psychological gamesmanship and the like, which we're all familiar with from television shows and mo many of you are familiar with from your time spent in the armed forces. Um, in January of 2002, the president made a determination that al-Qaeda detainees were unlawful combatants who were not entitled to the Geneva protections. The Taliban detainees were not POWs entitled to POW protection. And apparently thereafter, the rules of Geneva therefore were not thought to have to apply to such detainees. Um, and so the United States government came up with new, more coercive forms of interrogation that could be applied to such detainees. Now I think to, now what was the reason for this change? I think the two reasons have been cited, and I, I am not nearly expert enough to tell you whether these reasons 
do justify a departure from our tradition of abiding by Geneva. The first is that we need this intelligence more than we've ever needed intelligence from detainees before because our human intelligence has been so deficient with respect to Al-Qaeda and with respect to the war on terror. And therefore, we have more of a need than we have in any of our other wars or um, conflicts to actually get critical intelligence from people we have detained. The second is that apparently we have found, or so the story goes, that Al-Qaeda detainees are much more resistant to the decades-old techniques of psychological trickery and persuasion than were all other detainees that we've ever, um, that we've ever had under our control. And as Ms. McDonald was suggesting, that they simply were impervious to, um, to any attempt to, uh, to, to, to glean information from them. They, and in particular, she tells of certain accounts from Afghanistan, and, and I, I have no reason to think that they're not true, that suggest that Al-Qaeda actually trains its members to know what the United States law is, to know what our legal limits are, and to therefore know that interrogators can't go beyond a certain line. And therefore, if they know if they can withstand pressure up to that point, they're home free. And they do withstand pressure up to that point. And they are home free, and we don't get the sort of intelligence or information that we're looking for. Now, I have no idea whether this is really a new phenomenon or not, but this is the explanation for why we can no longer abide by Geneva. This is what makes it obsolete in Judge Gonzalez's words. I think that's what he means anyway. So what are the limits that were set? Well, I think the way to understand this is you have to look at it separated into two, two different sides of the US detainee operations, the military, the armed forces, and the CIA. The legal restrictions that are placed on the military are much more severe than those that are placed on the CIA with respect to interrogation procedures. In particular, there are two, two sets of, of restraints that are not placed on the CIA that are placed in the military. The first is that the Uniform Code of Military Justice prohibits assaults, prohibits um, cruelty, prohibits maltreatment of any prisoners, and prohibits any threats. Now, there hasn't been very much discussion of the UCMJ in this entire debate, and I don't quite know why, because one would think that much of what the Pentagon has been doing would, would violate the UCMJ, and that's something we can discuss. And the second is that on February 7, 2002, the President actually issued a directive that you may have all heard about requiring that detainees be treated humanely, that that be the baseline. Whatever else might happen, they must be treated humanely. Now, this memorandum, this directive in which he wrote this was, was addressed to most of his cabinet, war-related cabinet, the Attorney General, Director of Central Intelligence, National Security Advisor, State Department, Defense Department. But the directive that detainees be treated humanely was carefully written only to apply to the armed forces and not to apply to the CIA. And so the CIA is not under a presidential directive to treat detainees humanely. And so let me break down break this down just a little bit. First, going to the armed forces. OK, they have to treat detainees humanely. They can't threaten them and the like. Now, I'm not sure what the law is, in fact, within the Pentagon and what the rules are. We do know what, what, that, that there were several sets of rules promulgated by, um, by Defense Secretary Rumsfeld and by lower level officials throughout the Pentagon for several years. We don't know quite now what, what the rules are in different facilities, but we assume that, they, that humaneness and the UCMJ are baselines. Nevertheless, what we know about what's gone on in these facilities and what's been encouraged by Sanchez and Miller and others leads one to think that what the Pentagon means by humane is not quite what everyone else does. Now, Ms. McDonald brought up the meow mix example, but if, if the reports are correct, this is more like what what happened. I am bothered, by the way, but with, I, I don't think that my religious rituals are usually interrupted by compelled listening to Meow Mix commercials. But putting that aside, this is what was reported. Rumsfeld approved altering the environment to create moderate discomfort. At Guantanamo, that was translated as chaining prisoners to a low chair for hours with bright flashing lights in their eyes and audio tapes not only of Meow Mix and babies crying, but of Lil' Kim, Rage Against the Machine, and Eminem played loudly next to their ears. Now, that may be lawful or it may not be lawful, but I don't think most people would call that humane. 
Um, similarly, uh, adjusting sleep cycles. Well, in Iraq, the combination of sleep management and stress positions approved in the rules engagement um, led to instances in which hooded detainees were required to stand still on a box for hours, which led to excruciating pain and disorientation. False flag is not just simply pretending that you're from another nation. It's pretending as though you're sending, in some cases, that we're sending detainees to nations where they know torture is engaged in as a regular matter. That is to say, it is a threat of torture. Um, now, going on to the CIA, this is a long story that I've tried to, to give some further information on online in a series of blog posts, but I think the administration, what they have figured out is that all of the 16 or so limitations one might think apply to the CIA in terms of interrogation do not apply, and the only one that does is the torture statute. Um, and in particular, the administration, there is a provision of Article 16 of the Convention Against Torture that prohibits cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment. And the administration, through various different means, has construed that not to apply to the CIA in the following circumstances. When it's interrogating enemy combatants, Al-Qaeda and Taliban, and, and Iraqi insurgent detainees. It has to be by the CIA and done overseas, that is to say, at Guantanamo or other locations. Because if it were done in the United States, the Due Process Clause would prohibit this. The Due Process Clause prohibits any actions that shock the conscience, which is exactly the standard that the cruel and human and degrading treatment prohibition has been thought to, has been, according to the Senate, um, instantiates. And so what we have is for the CIA is them being able to engage in conduct such as waterboarding, um, threatening the deaths of family members and the like that is anything but humane and that would be unconstitutional if it occurred had these detainees been shipped to Puerto Rico or South Carolina. But instead, they are taken to overseas locations where the CIA has been authorized to do these sorts of, to, to, to engage in these forms of techniques. Now, going forward, how much time do I have? Not much. Okay. To my mind, there are four critical issues going forward. The first one is this geographic distinction for the CIA. Senator Durbin proposed a statute last year that would have outright prohibited cruel and human and degrading treatment by any U.S. official anywhere in the world. It was approved unanimously by the Senate, and the administration in insisted that it be taken out of the bill in conference. It seems to me a very modest thing to say that what we can't do to someone in Puerto Rico, we shouldn't be able to do to them in Guantanamo or at some foreign facility. And so this geographic distinction should be eliminated. The second, and I don't have nearly enough time to discuss this, is the big question that a lot of people have been asking is, should we apply Geneva's protections, which are much broader, across the board? Um, and that's something I think we, should, we could get into in the, in the questions and answers. I think there are very interesting debates about why Geneva doesn't apply. Um, and, and I agree, actually, with, some, with, with Ms. McDonald to some, I think, more than a lot of people on my side of the debate would, that many of these, de many of these detainees probably are not entitled to Geneva protections. But it doesn't strike me as necessarily, that it necessarily follows that they shouldn't, we shouldn't give them those protections. Um, the third and a huge issue is, who are we detaining? Who are we calling enemy combatants? What is the category? And I urge all of you to read Judge Green's decision in the Guantanamo case from January, in which she finally gets to this point. Everyone's been fixated on what procedures are due and are people getting lawyers and access to habeas and all that, none of which means a thing if the administration is allowed to use the broad definition of enemy combatant and unlawful combatant that it does. It doesn't just include people who plotted against us or who perform hostile acts against us for al-Qaeda or the Taliban. It is a dragnet that, that, brings, into, that brings into play virtually anyone who has ever been associated with or assisted those organizations in any way, even with respect to non-terrorist um, activities, something that I think is probably unconstitutional. Judge Green did, too. It, it violates, that, that would be inconsistent with Justice O'Connor's opinion in the Hamdi case. Uh, but this is a very big question. Regardless of what the interrogation techniques are, what is the pool of detainees to whom they may be applied? And finally, and this is the thing I've been thinking about the most lately, can we have a public debate about this at all? The administration's latest tactic, and, it, it, and it's a consistent one, is to say that 
this is a debate that we can't have in public. That whatever the law, and I mean the debate about what the law is and what the law shall be. Whatever the law is, they say, the one thing that's clear is that these detainees cannot know what our limits are. Um, somewhere here. I, well, that if they know, it, you've seen it on NYPD Blue, right, or 24 with Jack Bauer. The key, say many people, and I have no reason to, to disbelieve this, is it's not actual physical pain that gets you valuable information. It's the threat of physical pain and the uncertainty of not knowing what the limits are that your interrogator can go to. And, that, and so Ju uh, Judge Gonzalez, in his, in his uh, nomination hearings, said over and over again that he could not discuss what techniques were lawful and which were not, because that would give a roadmap to al-Qaeda. The roadmap metaphor is very prominent now. And this strikes me as something very troubling, that we can't have a public debate about what our limits are, that even if we can't torture or engage in cruelty, we have to pretend to the world and to these detainees as though we can and not have a public debate about it. For one thing, what techniques were allowable and what are not have been public in this country for decades. And, and I, I don't see any particular reason to change. For another, even the Pentagon's techniques, which Ms. McDonald will now cite to you chapter and verse, are on the public record, the, the ones that they've admitted that they, that they may use. But more importantly, I think this is a question about the rule of law. Are we going to have a secret law of interrogation, or are we going to have a public debate about what's acceptable and what's not? But that leaves a lot, of, a lot for the Q&A, but I'll leave it at that. Tell me if I get too close or too far <laughs> the uh, microphone. Uh, Judge Everett, uh, Emma Robertson. I, I guess we've pretty well formed the debate, and I think it is my responsibility now as the last speaker to actually tell you what the right answer uh, <laughs> is, is going to be. So listen up, and you'll hear it here over the course of the next uh, uh, 12 to 15 minutes, or what, whatever it is. Uh, I think there's something that we, some things that we can all agree on, uh, that although we can't agree on what the name of this is, whether it's a war on terror or, or whether it's a protracted struggle, whatever it is, I think it's pretty clear we have to win it. And I would submit to you uh, that we have to do whatever it takes to win. Uh, we have to take whatever actions are necessary to win this war or protracted struggle. The question is, what's winning? How do we know if we have won or not? The United States is the strongest nation on earth. And it's the strongest nation on earth not because of our vast military might or our economy or our diversity, or our natural resources, although all of those things are great strengths. We are the strongest nation on earth and have been for generations because of the rightness of our cause. And that's what we can't lose sight of. For many, many, many years, the United States has stood tall in support of human rights, in support of the rule of law, other nations have looked to us, and we have asked other nations to look to us for guidance on what those concepts mean. If we lose sight of that, we will have lost more than just the war. We will have lost our soul, and we will have lost the reason for fighting the war in the first place. War is a result of human failure, the abject result of human failure. The only purpose to have a war is to buy the time and the space necessary for real solutions to take place, economic, social, cultural, religious solutions to take place. War is also a prelude to peace. When you're fighting the war, you have to, in the course of fighting the war, prepare for the peace. There are some things that are so awful that civilized countries don't do them during a war. 
That's why we have rules of engagement and the law of war. That's why we identify war crimes, because we have to be ready for the peace in the end. And so what this discussion is really about, in my judgment, is just drawing lines. Where do we draw the line? What is it that we will permit ourselves to do, and what is it that we will not permit ourselves to do? The only weapon in the enemy's arsenal, the only real weapon in the enemy's arsenal, is terror. And the target of the terror, I don't think, is as much taking lives as it is to cause us to forego those things that we stand for and have stood for over the years, the rule of law, support of human rights. It's not the lives that they take. It's what they can make us do in this struggle, in this war, if we're not careful. They can bring us down to their level. And if that happens, we will have lost. Whatever happens, in a, however it ends, whenever it ends, in, in sort of the traditional sense, I think that the administration has failed to look forward, and I think that they failed to look back. If they had looked back, if they had looked at history, if they had looked at World War II, which, remember, is orders of magnitude, few if any of us in this room can re really remember World War II, was, but it was orders of magnitude, greater, worse, however you define it, than what this is and what this is likely to be. And yet, in World War II, we were careful to comply with the law of war as we understood it at the time. And in the wake of World War II, people like Truman and Eisenhower and Marshall came up with things like the Marshall Plan and the Geneva Conventions to help define how we were going to treat people. If they were looking in the future, the administration would understand that this is not the last war. This is not the war to end all wars. That was World War I. World War I was the last war. That was the final war. This isn't the last war we're going to fight. It's not even the next to last war we're going to fight. And we have to preserve our soul in this war so that we can fight the next wars. I think there are some interesting legal questions, and we've, we've touched on some of them. Do the Geneva Conventions apply or not? What about the, what's the role of the Constitution, the Convention Against Treaty, the War Crimes Act, and oh, by the way, Article 93 of the UCMJ? But I'd rather look at it or talk to you not as a lawyer, but perhaps as, I don't know, a theologian, a historian, a, a sociologist, an ethicist, a diplomat, a military officer, or even as an interrogator. Because I think that what we are doing, have done up to now, is wrong or unwise, legally to be sure, to me, the legalisms only provide the floor below which you won't go. But this is the United States of America, and we shouldn't be looking at the lowest possible way we can sink before we stop sinking. It's wrong legally. It's wrong morally. It's wrong diplomatically. It's wrong militarily. And it's wrong practically. Now, law isn't practiced in a vacuum. Law is practiced in real life. And we have to maintain touch, I think, with real life when we're making these decisions. And I think it's a mistake for us to parse the terms torture and say, well, this is torture, and this is cruel, and this is inhumane, and this is degrading, and you can do you know, two of those, but you can't do the others. And we're going to define torture very, very narrowly to include pain that results in organ damage, permanent organ damage, or even death. And we're going to define the defenses to torture very broadly to include self-defense, including the self-defense of country, not an immediate self-defense. I think all of those are unbecoming the United States of America, and it is, it's an effort from weakness 
rather than from strength. You know, we can talk about meow mix and uh, MREs. The fact of the matter is, the Army says that 28 people have died. Now, if they died as a result of meow mix, it just doesn't make any difference to me. If 28 people have died as the result of criminality on the part of US soldiers, if there are 300 cases of abuse that are being investigated, whatever the cause is, we have made a mistake. And we need to address those mistakes. And I think that saying it's a few bad apples over and over again is not addressing the mistakes. You know, is there anybody here that still believes that all this was the result of a few bad apples? You know, the church report, and I have great respect, I know Tom Church, I have great respect for him. I know him to be a, a fine and dedicated uh, and admirable admiral. But in the, in the 22 page, 21 page executive summary of the church report, and I haven't seen the, the 400 pages, but I've read in some detail closely the summary, the executive summary. It spends 20 or pages talking about how none of this could have possibly happened. It just, all, everybody knew it was policy, it was posted, they were trained to it, it could not possibly have happened. And then there's a page dedicated to how it did happen. The report says, in an interesting twist of logic, I think, that these things happened over a long course of time in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Gitmo, perpetrated by members of all the services, active duty, reserve, and guard, and that, therefore, there could be no single overarching reason how it could have all happened. It's just those damned old bad apples. They're all over. But we bear no responsibility for it because it's the bad apples. That's not a way to solve this problem. The problem has, exists. It's there. We can't pretend it's not there. And we can't just say it's a few bad apples. We're the United States of America. We're the strongest nation on earth. We don't have to do this. I'm going to be one of the few people who actually ends within the three-minute time limit. <laughs> it makes us weaker. It's counterproductive. It doesn't work. All the literature says torture doesn't work. What people don't like to hear is actually the way to get information is sort of through the Stockholm Syndrome. Make them your friend. It's not quite as gratifying as blurring meow mix in their ear, but that's the way to get information. Someone needs to stand up and say, they may be terrorists, they may be evildoers, but they're human beings. And we're Americans. And as Americans, we will treat them with the dignity and respect that Americans have always treated human beings by virtue of their humanity. So far, nobody said that. Thank you. Okay, before we open it up to the floor, I, I want to, uh, at, at Scott Solman's request, sort of direct a question to, to uh, oblige the speakers to speak to each other. And um, the, the one, it, it strikes me, in a sense, there was some talking past each other. And so let me ask, uh, I'm tempted to ask you to 
talk about your enthusiastic defense of the Dresden bombings, the Tokyo bombings, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, the internment of Japanese Americans, and other things that happened in World War II, but I'm not going to do, do that. Uh, uh, but instead, what about the challenge that, um, that Heather put forward and that Marty acknowledged, that it is, it's very possible that we are confronting an enemy that has trained itself to resist the Stockholm Syndrome, that has trained itself to resist techniques that you would be proud of watching. Uh, what are we to do when confronted with one of those? Is, are you denying that that could even happen so we don't need to address that problem? Or, or could, if it happens, what do we do then? I'm not denying that it happens, although I just hear it. You know, that, you know these are supermen that we have never faced before. Uh, you know, the Palestinians and Israelis have dealt with this. You know, that, that you can train somebody to resist torture for two days, but that after two days, anybody will talk. Uh, you know. That sounded like you're defending torture, I think. No, I, what I'm saying is that we, I could torture, we could torture these folks for two days and they would talk. They would tell us all kinds of stuff to make us stop the pain. But it, you know, what is what is it worth? The other problem is that it is that slippery slope because you know where do you stop? Do you, you know, if 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 it's okay, what you know, what what is the floor below which you won't sink? And I think that that's a problem. Uh, once you know, once you head down that road, uh, it. That is, uh, you know, the final destination, and that's not a line. That's not where I'd want to draw the line. That allows me to direct my question then to Heather, which is, that is the comeback is the slippery slope argument. You said it need not, we need not slip, and yet evidently we did. So how do we get out on the slippery slope without slipping? If, if, as he points out, we do not want to slip down. Uh, and you say evidently we did go down the slippery slope. Uh, I would disagree with Admiral Hudson. I think we do need to get into parsing. Uh, we have definitions of torture, and I think it is possible to rationally evaluate whether uh, 45 minutes of standing, which was all that was approved for Iraq, what you were talking about of having people stand for hours was never approved. I think it is possible to rationally conclude one way or another, does that meet the definition of torture? I don't think it does. I may be hard-hearted. I don't think having somebody in 45 minutes in a stress position, uh, when this is something that at the bare minimum people in army training go through and we don't even talk about SEER school, that that simply does not constitute torture. But your second question of didn't we go down the slippery slope? We abused prisoners. There is no question. And let me clarify, because I obviously wasn't clear enough. I do think the Pentagon is culpable for that. Admiral Hudson has sued Rumsfeld for the interrogation policies. I think that's the wrong suit. Now, I'm not an expert on sovereign immunity, so I don't know whether he stands a chance at all of suing Rumsfeld for any ground, but I think there's definite culpability there for the breakdown of military discipline that allowed the abuse to happen. However, I don't see what happened in Abu Ghraib and elsewhere as a slippery slope from the interrogation policies. What gets confused in this discussion constantly is the difference between what the policies were and the abuse of policy. Because policies were abused does not invalidate the policies themselves. We have prisoner abuse going on, unfortunately, in domestic prisons every day. Guards don't obey the rules all the time. Should they? Of course. Should the wardens be watching them like hawks? Of course. But the fact that prison guards in the US abuse their authority does not mean that we get rid of prisons. The fact that 
Abu Ghraib was a chaotic, outrageous situation where nobody was following the rules does not mean that the rules were wrong. So to me, it is completely feasible to say, I'm going to stop the, the line at uh, sleep management. And I don't consider that the deliberate infliction of, of severe pain and suffering. So, Marty, let me follow up on something you said, uh, actually two things you said. One is you called for a public debate. Um, it's in, and, and you uh, uh, criticized the administration's arguments for uh, why they didn't want one, and yet you acknowledged that, that those arguments might have bite, that, that making these things public does, in fact, undermine it. But let me ask you about another downside of a public debate. What if we had a public debate and the, the public came down uh, accepting practices that um, bothered uh, Admiral Hutz, uh, at least some of the folks that I've run into in my 43 years would, uh, would, would be of that sort? Uh, possibly. Um, I, I think, uh, actually, the, the, num the numbers are right now are actually rather remarkable um, when, when the public is asked about about various techniques. They're overwhelming, including, and these are questions about the techniques you know, being used on someone who has valuable information that could save American lives. And the numbers are overwhelming in the public opinion service. It took me by surprise, actually. I thought the numbers would be quite otherwise. Um, but, but yeah, no, there, there's a chance that, that perhaps some of the techniques that would be approved by our Congress uh, and by the public would be things that, that, that I would be, that would leave me quite upset or aghast. Um, but let me, let me say this. I don't think the administration will even propose any such thing. The administration will never propose any statute that would ever allow torture to be used. The administration will never allow any statute that will allow us to violate the Geneva Conventions. Let's say we had, let's say Al Qaeda actually, or the Taliban were entitled to Geneva protections because they wore uniforms, carried arms openly, and the like. Okay, but let's say they were just as hardened to our old techniques as Al Qaeda is said to be here. No one would argue, even though the interrogations would be futile, no one would argue that we should violate the Geneva Conventions because they put constraints on us that, that are futile. And there are reasons why we enter into treaties. Um, there are reasons why we don't violate treaties or try to get out of them. But that, and I don't think that the administration would ever even propose it. But that dodges thing. Heather's point, which is that offering Geneva protections to people who are not meeting the, not honoring their obligation to meet the prerequisite. Indeed, they, they can't do so for operational reasons. If they were to do so, they would be easily destroyed. So they, for their own self-interest reasons, do not meet the prerequisite. Uh, and her argument is extending them, those protections, weakens the accords because it, what incentive then is for any other army to ever to, um, to honor their obligations? Well, first of all, that's not the reason we're engaging in course of interrogations against them now, to give other nations in future wars incentives to abide by Geneva. That's just not why we're doing it. We're doing it because we want to get information, a very genuine and 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 understandable objective, but it is not this sort of incentive-based Geneva uh, objective. Um, but it is, a, it is an argument that, uh, that Heather's inject, injected in the debate, so I'm asking to respond to it. No, but Heather doesn't think that's the reason we should be engaged in coercive interrogation here. But the second thing but is there are plenty of armies and the Viet Cong and non-army personnel who over the decades have clearly not been subject to Geneva protections who we have treated in accord with Geneva as a policy matter, not as a legal matter, and the sky has not fallen. It hasn't caused other nations to, to, to di diverge from Geneva any more than, it hasn't affected the compliance with Geneva by other nations. That compliance may not be very good, but it's not because we've accorded the Viet Cong particular what right. we are doing is torturing the audience now, because I'm not calling on them. So I will uh, move from my position of abuse and now start calling. And you, sir, have the first one. Ben Davis. Oh, thank you. Oh. Hello. Oh, one, two, three. Hi. My name is Ben Davis. I'm from the University of Toledo Law School. And there's a couple of questions uh, that I have. It's one I asked Justice Ginsburg in DC last week. And I'll come back to you all again. 
First is, is uh, two, uh, two parts of a comment. One is, uh, at lunch, Mr. Pavitt talked about Al-Qaeda having pulled the brass ring. Yes, they did when they did 9-11. I had a friend who was killed in that building at World Trade Center. But Al-Qaeda pulled another brass ring when, Al, when Abu Ghraib happened, in terms of us in, 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 in the Middle East. I've talked in my public international law class, and one of my students, who's a future JAG, said to me, there's something in the military, and I understand there's military people here, called shit rolls downhill. Are people in the military aware of that here? OK. Well, I consider what Ms. McDonald is talking about is a shit rolls downhill approach, which is basically that the people at the bottom are bad apples. Now, no one in your right mind believes that. And my thing is about shit rolling uphill, OK? And I mean, criminal responsibility, what, what, if you ask what I would have done on 9-11, on 9-12, I would have fired Rumsfeld and I would have fired George Tenet because we paid too much money for that kind of shit to happen, okay? But the thing I would ask let, about is criminal responsibility question, yeah, for high-level civilians because from what I've found in my research, we've never gone after criminal, international criminal law responsibility for high-level civilians for violations of international criminal law like torture, like genocide, like war crimes. Finally, for uh, Dean Hudson, Please, and this is a very delicate point to raise here in North Carolina, but please understand that in our history, we have treated people horribly. That was called slavery. And I have in my bag the bill of sale from 1799 in Edenton, North Carolina for my fifth generation parent. So don't tell me we treat them always nice. We don't, and that's a terribly real thing to me all of a sudden. And she was sold to somebody who was a sign of the Declaration of Independence and, two, and, and of a family that had two presidents in the United States. So we do awful things, and that's it. But the best in us, it's like Thurgood Marshall said, fought to create the, the, the protections at the Civil War. And we have to remember that in the Libra Code and all those efforts at those times to do things the right way. So I want shit to run uphill. Thank you. Any responses, which is more of a comment, I think, than a Well, but I would respond. I would agree that there should be command responsibility for the abuse. But I think it does matter a great deal what exactly we're holding people responsible for. Be because we need to look at the whole framework here. If, if you're saying we're, we're holding them responsible for their policies, policies that began or were eventually ratified under the decision that terrorists do not fulfill the letter of the text of the Geneva Conventions, policies that did sanction modest stress interrogation techniques, that I think would be a mistake because I think those are valid decisions and I think they're ones that we're going to need going out. Holding them responsible, holding Janice Karpinski responsible, it is we've been waiting too long. And possibly Sanchez, who kept their, her in there because she was a woman, and wanted to mentor her for, for the Army's diversity figures. I think that's outrageous. So the fact that, that abuse happened should be punished. I would like to put, however, uh, Mr. Hudson's figures in context. Most of the abuse that happened happened at the point of capture. A small percentage of it was interrogation or even happened in detention centers. The fact that it happens in a detention center does not mean it's part of an interrogation. Uh, the majority of deaths happened at point of capture. I would like to know how many the numbers that have died so far compare to previous wars. Maybe it's huge, maybe it's not. Obviously, one is one too many. But again, let's not confuse uh, interrogation policy with other kinds of abuse. Abu Ghraib, there was nobody that sanctioned forced masturbation, beating people. No, it, you show me, I would love to see the rule that allowed that. Okay, we, I have Warren and then Will and then over here and then over there. So I've got four people. Just raise your hand and I'll get you on the list as best we can. Warren? Uh, Warren Wickersham. Um, it's not clear to me, uh, Dean Hudson, if um, your view is, and I accept much of it, but if the interrogation will not lead to any result under the, in the conditions you're suggesting, that we just give up the interrogation 
And it, let me just pose a question. If we were to say now, not as a threat uh, in the Im to, against an individual, but that we are not being successful in this line of uh, uh, interrogation, so that from now on, if we catch an al-Qaeda person, we're going to turn them over to the Saudis or the Pakistanis or something, it's not a general threat, they're going to deal with it because it's their problem. We're not going to subject our people to uh, uh, abuse for what they do, so we're just going to turn them all over to them. Would that be acceptable in your mind? Not if that were the, uh, the reason for doing it. If, if, I'm it not we sure are not going to be I successful would... interrogating them without uh, just the general rules, just trying to ask them a question. They're not going to give up any information. Under no. any of the circumstances you described, I would, okay. su I would submit. And if that's the case, we say, our, our system's not going to work, so we're going to give them to the, to the uh, you know, their country of origin, if that's a country that uh, we are friendly with. I guess I've got three responses. Uh, one uh, is that uh, if what you're talking about is extraordinary rendition, you know, sending them to a country where we know that there, we, there may be a wink and a nod, but we have reason to believe that they're going to be tortured and we're, we're willing to take the information that results from that, then I think it goes back to the public debate. I'd rather torture them myself or have the United States torture them. If that's what we're going to do, we ought to do, do it ourselves rather than sending them someplace to have somebody else do our dirty work. If the goal is, uh, as the, discussed in the Gonzalez hearing you know, with, with President Duarte, you, you clip off a, a, a joint at a time until they just got a stub. If, if that's what we're, we're sending them to Syria or Egypt or Turkey or someplace to have that happen, I'd rather just, I think it, we ought to have that public debate and do it ourselves rather than sending out the dirty work. The other point is that 3452, the, 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 the field manual that has been the standard for this, is not just, hi, how are you doing? You know anything you want to tell us? I mean, you can do lots of aggressive things under that, which we, has been the military doctrine for many, many, many years. All the playing around that we've done since 9-11 is a change in doctrine. And then finally, my understanding in the reading and in, in talking with people is that it's not effective. Uh, you know, we, we do desperately need information. There's no question about it. And the question, but the, that begs the question of how do you best get the information? And from what I understand, the best information is not gleaned through torture. It's gleaned through other methods that are not necessarily just, you got, you, you know, you're not going to be able to watch the West Wing tonight. You know, okay, I'll tell you everything I know. You know. But if I understand your argument, even if it were to work, you would still oppose it. So, and then I think Warren was saying, what if that's the only thing that works? Even and you, if, you know, that's, that's Senator Specter's uh, and, and Mayor Koch's uh, ticking bomb question, you know, that in some respect. I would say my, my rule would be there are some things in war you don't do, and that even if it worked, even if it were effective, even if it were demonstrated to be effective, I would not countenance Torture, however we define torture. No, I'm responding to. I'm responding right. to what uh, we have. Will next. Yeah, Will Curtis, U.S. Naval Academy. A couple of things. One is I, I, I'm wondering about the culture aspect of all of this. I, I recall uh, when I was in the Air Force, we had to go through air crew survival training, and part of that was escaping evasion, being captured, and hit. Hell, and the most distressing thing about that was, it seems to me, I don't know, it must have seemed like ours, they played this Chinese music that went cling dong bong, drove me absolutely ape. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing was, when I was stationed in Okinawa, we had a carpenter, Mr. Kuma, and he would, he would squat down for hours uh, working on a project. Now, what what I'm asking and what I'm suggesting is that maybe culture has a lot to do with how you define terror, I mean, torture. 
because there is no way that I think in America could squat down for hours and work like that. It would be pure torture to us. So in devising some of these techniques in your analysis of them, have you taken into consideration the impact of culture? I guess, Heather, that was more to you. Well, there may be a cultural component to meals ready to eat or sleep management. I don't know. Uh, again, the Iraq rules for stress positions was 45 minutes maximum. Those were the rules. Uh, and, and the rules for Iraq said we're going to abide by Geneva's and everything has to be done humanely and to use stress you have to get permission. Uh, I mean there may be some, some stress techniques that exploit cultural differences but I don't see that the ones that have been devised so far do and I would just disagree the people I've spoken to I disagree with Admiral Hudson, and we may just have a completely different set of sources. Uh, the interrogators I've spoken to, Afghanistan and Guantanamo, uh, say the harsher methods we use, the better information we got. Now, harsher, not torture. Again, I, I am trying to distinguish here stress from torture. I'm not advocating torture, but the most important tool that people found everywhere were marathon sessions. The rule in Guantanamo was 16 hours max sleep deprivation. As one intelligence sergeant told me, yeah, it stinks, but it's no worse than what we went through in army school. Uh, so, you know, I've spoken to a guy in, in uh, in Afghanistan that kept a kid uh, who was an accomplice of a bomb maker uh, standing for a while and he definitely used uncertainty. It was, the, these guys knew by law the interrogators could not lay a finger on them. So what does this guy do? He comes up and he grabs him by the collar and he makes him stand up. Now is that torture? I don't think so, but the purpose was to increase his uncertainty so he didn't know where the interrogator's limits were. The boy did break. He disclosed who his accomplice was and where some roadside bombs were hidden. To me, again, it's all, the devil is in the details. You can have platitudes about losing your soul and, and I, you know, maybe Al-Qaeda attacked us in order to make us change the Army Field Manual. I disagree. I think they attacked us because they wanted to kill as many Americans as they could. But I don't think we're losing our soul by grabbing a boy by his collar and making him stand. Marty, did you want in on this? Uh, well, I... H Heather mentioned that we want to make it so that the detainee doesn't know what might come and, and is fearful that, you know, he hasn't been tortured, but maybe he might be. Well, that's, it's an implicit threat of torture. And maybe we should permit threats of torture, if not torture itself. Um, but it strikes me that we would have to have statutory amendments to do that. We'd have to amend the Uniform Code of Military Justice. We would have to, as, a, as applied to persons who are protected by Geneva, we'd have to violate the accords or, or, or do something to them. Um, and I'm not sure we want to go there. But I wanted to also disagree with Dean Hudson because I, I agree that this does occasionally work in some sense. Or at the very least, our interrogators believe that it works. They're going to great troubles to do these things because they think it works. But it works in this sense. It works once in a blue moon. And what we're doing here is taking huge haystacks and looking for needles. We're interrogating, coercively interrogating, lots and lots of detainees looking for the one who will give us that information and occasionally it might happen i mean by all accounts waterboarding abu zubaydah got us to khalid sheikh mohammed and we tortured him and he gave up the names of others it does work occasionally but at enormous cost um, and i think that's the debate we need to have what 
just leads me to a question, because a, a sincere, genuine question, I don't know what Heather thinks about this. Do, Heather, do you agree that, with respect to the CIA, that conduct that would be cruel and human and degrading if it occurred here should be, like waterboarding, should be illegal across the board? Or do you think that that should be permissible? Permissible because it's off, off territory? For whatever reason. The, the administration the thinks there's a, a, a loophole now. The Senate tried to close it. The administration insists on not closing it. Would you rec would, do you think it should be closed, or do you think that we should, have, we should leave open the ability to waterboard detainees in order to get information from them? It's a very tough question. It's a good question. And I guess if I was up, if I had the uh, ticking time bomb or the gun to my head. No, you just have Abu Zubaydah think, in yeah, custody. Right, right. I think if you have a very, 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 very high value uh, detainee, I probably would allow waterboarding. Even because though if you did it here in the United States, it would be unconstitutional. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. and, and, and also, let's remember that uh, the CIA is not without oversight. Uh, it's not broad, but no, but there are uh, heads of committees that are consulted with what the CIA is doing. So it's, there's political responsibility there as well. We have a number of people on the list. You're next. Yeah, well, uh, again, it's Tim. Um, I thank you for that comment, Heather. I hope that we can avoid discussing the mix from now on, since you've just endorsed the more serious techniques, which is what we really, I think, are talking about. I agree with you that no one believes that some of the things you mentioned are torture. So I don't really oh, understand why we're talking ask about Ask the New York Times. Um, well, I just, I, I'd like to see the editorial, because I think you're taking it out of context. Um, the, uh, I'd like to ask a specific question again. Um, it seems to me that one thing that we're getting uh, a little bit bollocked up about is the issue of whether a particular detainee is entitled to prisoner of war status. And I'm going to ask a question of how important that really is. Um, you know, we discussed the, the, the prohibition against all forms of torture and all forms of cruel and human and degrading treatment has, does not depend on the status of the person who's being held. Um, it, it's a principle of international law that applies across the board to all people in all circumstances. And, and I, I think that you know, there, there, is a, there is a question, you know, because of the administration has tried to open this loophole in the, uh, in the treaty about the applicability of that cruel and human and degrading treatment provision to detainees held abroad by the CIA. But you know, that really, as far as I'm aware, was not ever raised when the treaty was being ratified. And, and I don't really know that there's any support for it uh, anywhere else. And so I guess my question is, my question really is, does it ultimately matter at the end of the day if a particular prisoner is or is not entitled to POW status when the prohibition is against cruel and human and degrading treatment and all of the things that we're really talking about applying to these prisoners would clearly meet that test of being cruel and human or degrading treatment. Uh, waterboarding, um, stripping detainees naked, um, you know, rubbing menstrual blood on a detainee, which is one, which are all things which happened in Guantanamo. And all of which were illegal. Um, all, prisoners are being, I'm sorry, soldiers are being convicted, are being uh, prosecuted for that. But, but Heather, you just advocated allowing some of those techniques in circumstances um, when the people are being held by the CIA. I want to reserve so it. I, right. I am, so I am not confident. that you want to be prosecuted. I'm not advocating it. I'm just being completely honest that I am not confident that in the future we may not face a situation with a single detainee where a technique as extreme as waterboarding uh, may not be a last resort. Do I think it should be a first resort? No. Do I think that the military should adapt, adopt those techniques across the board for uh, enemy combatants? Absolutely not. I just, I, I, I don't feel that I can predict 
the future of this threat, I, I don't advocate physical torture, but, but something like waterboarding, uh, I don't know. It's a very tough question, and I, I am, you know, I, I go back and forth on this, but I, I just, I'm concerned about the possibility of an extraordinarily devastating attack. Okay, back there. It's also just a factual question. It's, it's not the case that the less coercive measures are uncontroversial. Uh, maybe the ACLU in the United States is of Cerner stuff, but I was in England during the time when these issues were first being raised right after um, in the late fall of, of 2001, and even things like putting hoods on prisoners during transport, that was in fact the level of, the level of outrage in England over the hoods uh, was, was extreme, and that, that's um, considerably less coercive than waterboarding. So I, I think there, that we will have to split hairs because if you broaden it up to the global community, there's not an agreement about what level of coercion is degrading in human, et cetera. <laughs> So then we still have to talk about meow mix as well. well no, I, no, I want to talk about because I, even if it's not cruel and human and degrading, it, cruel and human and degrading is a term of art. The Senate ratified the treaty and explained that it meant actions that would shock the conscience so to the extent that they would violate the due process clause here domestically. But let me g go one step back. Techniques that are, would clearly be prohibited by Geneva but that would not be cruel and human and degrading, such as nudity, Forced nudity, hooding, the use of dogs, the use of dogs. It's degrading in a colloquial sense, but I don't think, I'm not sure that it would violate the Constitution. Um, no, no, but. Precisely. But, you know, let me get to my point. These <laughs> techniques, threatening the lives of the family of, of the detainee, hooding, forced nudity, the use of dogs to induce stress, were approved as humane and legally available by the Department of Defense General Counsel, a nominee to your fine circuit here were approved by General Rumsfeld as available generally in December of 2002, were never prohibited by General Rumsfeld, even after he rescinded that he particular rescinded Secretary Rumsfeld. He did Secretary not. Rumsfeld. But he didn't approve Secretary them. Rumsfeld. He rescinded. He said that they may not be used without his permission. No, he, re he rescinded. Apparently, both Rumsfeld and Haynes believe that those techniques are humane and are not prohibited by the Uniform Code of Military Justice. They've never suggested otherwise, let me put it that Let way. Let's uh, move on. You're next. And yes, then my name is, uh, you, yes, my name is Michael Dudley. I'm a student at East Carolina University. I'm also a um, Navy veteran. And one thing I'd like to say right up front that I love this country, but I'm not naive of the fact that we have not always followed the idealistic human rights course. And dealing with that, I'm not really looking at our past with, I guess, slavery or Jim Crow segregation because of around that time, the world was looking at us and asking us why we were doing that to our own citizens. But after World War II, we really pressured the uh, German citizens to break, break them and get them out of that party by using all types of tactics and torture methods, and we really haven't talked about that. But for me as a veteran, it seems to me that treating our own prisoners better than these individuals who declared war on us, we have to treat them with kitten gloves, is a huge mistake and a slap in the face of any military personnel person. But one thing I want to ask you guys is, why can't we find levels of torture? That seems to be one of the most idealistical ways of doing it, looking at their cultural background and looking at our own cultural background and finding those different levels because throughout our whole lives, we have different levels that we have to follow. Maybe that, that was to I, you to John, and then. I, I guess, I guess you're, I infer from your question that if you had levels of torture, at least some of those levels would be legal. It's like levels of homicide. Yeah, what we're comfortable with, or what we say that we'd be comfortable with without going over. Yeah, I, um, uh, that's, it's interesting, because that's precisely what I think we ought not to do. Uh, and, 
obviously there's disagreement over that. I, I think that that heads you down the slippery slope. And I think that it is a very, very difficult thing to do for the cultural reason that was mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, you know, there are a couple of Marines up there. I am sure that those guys could withstand things that Judge Everett couldn't. <laughs> and uh, don't underestimate. He's well, a tough don't bird. I wouldn't. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> yeah. um. <laughs> You know what? You know what? What you can do to a a 21-year-old able-bodied person is just different than what would be you could do to an older person. And so that you know, standing there for 45 minutes might be okay for one, and and be torturous for the other. So that once you start trying to define it in words, I think, and that's part of the problem we're in here, I guess is that it, 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 you can't do it because there are so many, uh, so many differences, cultural and, and otherwise. So you're putting the security of our nation above the dignity of the main of the individual? I wouldn't define it that way. I wouldn't define it that way. I think the security of our nation is <laughs> safeguarded by those things that we stand for, not by uh, torturing people, at, at, whether it's first degree torture or second degree torture or third degree torture. I don't think that that creates security. You, you may stop a thing, but as we you know, heard at lunch, there are so many things out there that stopping a thing I don't think is worth it if we give up so much in the process that we are no longer the same country that we once were and now suddenly we're Paraguay. We, we have time just to collect the last three questions, and then I'll give the panelists uh, time to respond. So that, that would be you, and then Mark, and then you. Those are the last three. Uh, oh, thanks. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Reardon from uh, Camp Lejeune. Uh, having spent my whole adult life in the military, I, I've got to say I wasn't at all surprised when Abu Ghraib came up. Um, and I think it was, at least from my perspective, it was caused by many of the assumptions that Ms. McDonald seems to be making. And, uh, for example, the assumption that she seems to make, that every Marine makes, every soldier probably makes, is if I've detained this person, he knows something. And if he's not talking, it's because he's highly trained. And it goes back to that, you know, if they're running, they're VC. If they're not running, they're well-disciplined VC. Uh, <laughs> and, and the problem with that assumption is, I'm going to do everything I can to get that information out of them. And, there may be an official policy, but that's the next assumption, that official policy is somehow important. The more important thing is the unofficial policy. An unofficial policy comes to me in a lot of ways. It, it comes to me by whether or not the people above me care about the piece of paper they've stuck in front of my face. You do that with rhetoric. When you're getting up and you're telling me how these people aren't human beings and I can do whatever I need to do to get it, that tells me the unofficial policy. When on Armed Forces Radio, the only political commentator is Rush Limbaugh and he's telling me that it's okay to do these things, because they're the sort of thing you do on frat that, uh, at frats that'd be an unofficial sort of policy. And, that, and, and we could see that there's an unofficial policy that there wasn't necessarily a lot of concern for this sort of thing. That here's our official policy, that's a CYA policy. That's the, that's the perception that you have at the lowest levels. It may not be accurate, but if you don't want that perception, you have to work really hard not to get it. And that's the next assumption you have to wonder about. You have to ask yourself is, who do you think is at the ground level doing these things? We don't go to the seminaries to do recruiting. We, we grab people off the street and you have people who are going to go to that lowest level. And when you tell them, for example, they can use stress positions, you can make this guy, you can affect his sleep position or you can affect his sleeping time. What happens when he says, screw you, I'm going to sleep? Well, now the good Marine's going to go kick him in the head to wake him up. So you've crossed that line. So you have this whether you, you think that slippery slope won't happen, it will because that's the people we have. They're not necessarily bad people, but they're going to try to do everything they can to get the job done. And as, as uh, Ms. McDonald pointed out, as they get further and further down the line, they get better intel. Well, as the Salem witch trials started using more and more torture, they got better intelligence also. And that's, that's the problem. You have to have, you can't just have an official policy 
pieces of paper are not self-actuating. You have to have something, you have to have leadership, and uh, I think that's my concern. But going to one other thing, just we're, so I can we're get gonna, my We're gonna question. have to take, let's, let's go, because uh, she has to actually leave. You may, in fact, have to leave. So let's just get, do you have, you're next, and you are next. Very briefly, uh, and Heather, I'll let you go first, and then you can bug out. Uh, okay. I have just one uh, very specific question. Uh, the Reverend has said uh, that his concern is waterboarding would violate uh, the Constitution. My question for the whole panel is, does waterboarding violate the torture statute, which of course applies to all Americans all over the world? And last. Uh, thank you. Uh, um, um, I'm talk, um, my about Geneva Convention, I'm not going to debate on, on, on that. We, uh, we have uh, lots of debates on from the panels. But uh, we are all here, I think, for the ac academic exercise that we are. Um, if, if, if for that reason, if, if, we, if we agree that the philosophically that laws are made for us because we, for us to need order, then uh, uh, we have this Geneva Conventions of 1949 on the on on war, which is um, basically a, a set of rules in, in in times of war, in particular in prisoner of war. Then we have this war on terrorism, where uh, the Geneva Convention, some say it may it may it cannot be applied because it is not conventional, because they do not wear uniforms, they do not have chain of command, and so forth. Then if we took that away, the Geneva Conventions, uh, what do you think of the panels? Uh, is the war on, ter on terrorism do not need order to fight it? We don't need legal order to fight that? Because uh, b besides other than Geneva Conventions, we don't have anything on international law on, on that order. Thank you. Oh, OK. Uh, Heather has to leave to make I'll her flight. So quickly, in response <laughs> to the gentleman from San Francisco, said these were not human beings. The, the rule was, what was said was they don't qualify for Geneva Convention status, a, a judgment that I find perfectly appropriate. What was said immediately following that was they deserve to be treated with humanity. They deserve humane treatment. So nobody, and Rush Limbaugh is not making policy for the military. Uh, of course we need leadership to back up the policies. But the, what I find curious is this reification of the status quo that somehow the 16 techniques that we've come up with are the only possible techniques, and that any change from them is necessarily a move into torture. If we had had 12 techniques, and what we were talking about was adding good cop, bad cop, my guess is you would say that that also was a slippery slope towards torture. To me, there is nothing sacrosanct about the 16 we have, especially when we are completely outside of a Geneva Convention context uh, in looking at terrorists. Do we know that everybody's terrorist? Of course not. And maybe we should have had Article 5 hearings. That I would not object to. Uh, but again, let me just stress, we have to get information. OK, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Marty and John and then. I have two technical responses. Well, one's a follow-up about the culture and, and, and what the folks on the ground and in the detention centers are, are understanding. Another component of what they see in are thought to think is, is acceptable. And this is from the Faye Jones report is, this, like I was suggesting, the CIA has been given the green light to do a lot more than what the military has expressly been allowed to do. And the CIA detentions and interrogations are happening side by side, and the military folks see what's going on and what the CIA can get away with. And it, at least according to these reports, that also affects, understandably, what they think is legally permissible. Is waterboarding prohibited by the torture statute? Waterboarding apparently means at least two different techniques, if not more. There's a, there's a drip a drip torture and a dunking uh, method, and folks in this room may know more than that. But I've been told of, of at least two. We don't know exactly which one OLC signed off on as being not a violation of the torture statute. It's hard for me to understand why it wouldn't be a violation of the torture statute, but here's what I suspect we'll see if we ever see that OLC memo. I think they will see, say that it doesn't cause severe physical pain, because in fact it, 
it's more the, the fear and the threat and the disorientation and the feeling that you're going to drown. So the question is, it causes severe mental pain, but is it prolonged as the statute requires? You know, maybe they've said you can do this for 15 or 20 minutes, but not for an hour. You know, you can put them in fear of their lives for 15 minutes, and it's severe mental pain, but it's not prolonged mental pain. I'm, I'm totally guessing here because it, it, my instinct would be to say that yes, that violates the statute. All right, listen up. Here's the answer, and this will be on the exam. <laughs> I have kind of the same feeling that I had at the, uh, when I testified at the Gonzales hearing. Uh, you know, there we were in the main committee room of the United States Senate Judiciary Committee, uh, Republicans and Democrats, uh, supporters and not supporters, arguing the merits of torture, you know, the pros and cons. You know, whether one form of waterboarding is permissible, but the other form of waterboarding is impermissible. Uh, it's not a rule of law if you don't enforce it all the time, if you only enforce it when it's convenient. And uh, uh, you know, Heather talks about, well, it wasn't policy, you know, it, was, you know, it wasn't the rule. You know, we know what happened. And, you know, it's U.S. policy or it's not U.S. policy. Either way, we lose. Uh, because it happened, and I, I think that that is unfortunate, and I think we got to get this car in reverse pretty quickly. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's thank our panel for this afternoon. I've uh, never accused Peter of running a dull panel. Uh, a, few, uh, a few closing comments for the day. First of all, if any of you need CLE credit, CLE credit. There are forms out there on the desk if you need CLE credit, either for North Carolina or we have a multi-state form for you to pick up. Secondly, uh, for those of you who have signed up for the reception and dinner tonight, the cocktail reception is in the law school. The law school is just down the block. It's the very next building. We are in the Fuqua School now. It is the next building down and it's at the corner of Science Drive and Tower View. All the doors to the law school will be open, and there will be bars set up on both the third and fourth floors. You are cordially invited. That will start no later than 6.30. I suspect some of you may want to hit it early. Uh, now, in the event, in the event that it is raining, I have arranged for vans. I have arranged for vans to, it is raining now? All right, let me change this. Now that it's raining, uh, if it is still raining at 6.30, there will be vans that will pick people up at the entranceway to the Thomas Center. You remember where we had lunch for the, those of you who joined us? If you go up the stairs, vans will be shuttling folks from that entrance to the front of the law school and then shuttling you back. We have hired vans for this purpose, and I guess it was a wise investment. Um, secondly, uh, Please, tonight, if you are coming to join us, wear your name tag simply because for the Thomas Center, they need to be able to distinguish you. They probably can from the weary eyes anyway, but the name tag will help them. Uh, lastly, please do not leave anything in this room. Uh, we cannot guarantee it. The cleaners will come in, et cetera. So please take all your belongings, your notes with you. We will be starting again in here at 8.15 tomorrow morning. So for those of you to the cocktail party, we'll see you no later than 6.30 in the law school. For the rest of you, we'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning.